We're here to see Mark uh, Elberston, the Swedish man, to talk, to talk about Eleanor Roosevelt. Anything else what? I can say about you? Yeah. All right. Yeah. There you go. Anyway, good afternoon. Good afternoon. And it's not a bad afternoon. I, what a cold snow, it beats the rain we were getting. Anyway, it's about Eleanor Roosevelt, who, by the way, actually will, as a first lady, will turn that position into an office. That's what she makes it. But the, 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 the important thing about Eleanor Roosevelt is the time she's born into. You know, she's born in October of 1884. That's only 19 years after the Civil War's over. And she's born seven years after federal troops will leave the South, marking the end of Reconstruction. And she's born into an era where the Hamiltonian notion beat the Jeffersonian notion to decide what track this country's finally going to take. And that track will be industrialization, finance, capitalism. That's where it goes. It's the North who beats the South in America's first industrialized war. That's what you saw here. But the country still is still the West, is still the old West still exists. You know, she's born in, she's born into an America where you're still moving by horse and wagon, and yet she dies in the era of the Cuban Missile Crisis. What happened here in 78 years to this country? Interesting what happens here. She's born into a family known in New York as the Swells. In other words, these people aren't on the breadline. Uh, they're rich. She's born into that privileged class. Her father is Elliot Bellick Roosevelt, which, by the way, with her father, she is related to Theodore Roosevelt, who will soon be president of the United States, and Anna Rebecca Hall. She comes from a family that was wealthy as well. She's born Eleanor Anna Roosevelt. She will choose to be called a Eleanor. She likes the name Eleanor. She carries herself in a fashion that even her mother is going to call her Granny. That's what she's known as even as a kid. She has a brother called Elliot Jr. He's born in 1889, and another brother known as Hall. Roosevelt. These people don't, some of these people don't seem to live long. Not at all. In fact, she had a stepbrother, Elliot Roosevelt Mann, who was the product of, a fa of her father's indiscretion with, a hot, with, a hot, with an in-house domestic named Katie Mann. It's her half-brother. Yet he dies by 1951, 1941. He's only 51 when he dies. Her mother will die of diphtheria when Eleanor is 10 years old. Her brother, Elliot Jr., dies at four years old when Eleanor is, is 11, or, pardon me, at nine years old uh, from diphtheria. And her father, who is a hopeless alcoholic, will die when Eleanor is 10 years old. So her mother died at eight, her, one of her brothers dies at nine, at her, when she's nine, and, one, and her father dies when she's 10. Her father actually threw himself out of the window of a sanitarium. That didn't kill him, he had a later, later had a seizure, and then he dies. Now, this is not a good start, despite the money. This is not a good start. She's gonna go live with her grandmother, Mary Livingston Ludlow, and by the time she's 12 years old, 13, 14, she has to sleep with her bedroom door locked because she can't trust her grandmother's sons. Now, that's not a brilliant start, is it? Not really. However, you know, a woman of, the, of, this, a woman of, this, of this type, young lady of this type, many of these young ladies went to finishing schools. You know how this was with the rich, right? She's going to be sent out of the country to Allenswood in, in, um, in England, Wimbledon, right outside London. And she's here when she's 15 years old. And this is a big change in her life. She's the, the, the schoolmistress here is a lady called Marie Sylvester. Marie Sylvester likes to teach her, the young ladies in, these, in this school to be free thinkers, critical thinkers. It's here that Eleanor is going to learn things like how to speak French, history, dance, 
And I, you see the well-rounded individual that's beginning to be cast here, just like all these young ladies were when they went here. And she really likes it here. Well, compared to where she's coming from, wouldn't you? Yeah. And so she's, she's turning out to be this well-rounded individual that eventually she will become. But like everything else, all things come to an end. And this is another important aspect of this. This is the first time that I, research tells me that she's exposed to people who are homosexual because Marie Sylvester was a lesbian. So she's exposed to this. It's another part of education, isn't it? And so she's called home. Now she's at that age, 18, going on 19, where she's going to go to you know, those coming out parties. You're being introduced to society, to you know, so on and so forth. And half these parties were a waste anyway, but she goes anyway. You know, she's going to meet relatives she probably hasn't seen before, and probably a good chance she's not going to see again. Friends of the family, so on and so forth. At one of these get-togethers, she meets a young man who happens to, buy, to be, by the way, a cousin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And the two hit it off. This is 1902. Enter Sarah Delano Roosevelt, Franklin's mother, the domineering Mrs. Roosevelt. She does not like the idea that her son is now falling for this young lady. Well, forget the fact she's a cousin. She doesn't think this lady's good enough for her son. That's what she thinks. And she will try to do everything she can to sabotage this relationship. Finally, Franklin speaks up to his mother and says, I know I've hurt you here, but I know my own mind, and I know what I want. So what does Sarah do? She takes her son on a three-week vacation to the Caribbean, hoping three-month vacation, hopefully, hoping he forgets her. That's not happening. They come back, and they get engaged in 1903, and they are going to get married in 1905. Now, you, you ladies in particular, aren't you the ones that usually plan the weddings? The guy just shows up, right? Isn't that basically how it works? Well, add to this the, the sometimes difficulties of planning a wedding. Uh, the man who's going to give her away, remember, her father's dead. The man who's going to give her away is Theodore Roosevelt. He's a president. You have to work around his schedule. That's another impediment, right? Well, he says, hey, I'm going to be in, um, I'm going to be in New York City on March 17. This is 1905. That's St. Patrick's Day. He's there for a St. Patrick's function. Why don't you get married that day? So they do. They get married. They get married on St. Patrick's Day. Now, since the president is giving the bride away, uh, you know, all, all, all the society reporters show up because this is a society wedding. However, in this instance, once they're married, guess who the journalists are going to flock to? The president. The president's here. They're going. That's good in a way to the to the to the to the young couple here. That's that's good. But one of the questions sticks out here, Mr. President. How do you think uh, of this wedding since both the but the bride and the groom had the same name to start with? He goes, well, it's nice to keep it in the family. <laughs> and so now they're married, and they're gonna ha they're gonna live up at Hyde Park, but they're also gonna live in apartments on the west side of New York. And they spend a week up in Hyde Park, uh, although down the road they're going to spend a three-month honeymoon in, uh, in Europe. In the meantime, they live for the most part in their apartments on the west side of New York. Guess who has the adjoining apartment complete with sliding doors? Sarah Delano Roosevelt. Yeah. They're going to have six kids over the next 10 years. Eleanor, is it, it, this is a great character study, if, 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 if you're into psychiatry, I guess, or, psych, or if you're a psychologist. She has six children, yet she's not a fan of sex. She says to her, she said to Anna, the oldest child was Anna. She says to her, having children is a chore. Having children is, is, quite, a, is quite a chore. She doesn't think she is actually uh, constructed to raise little children. Yet this is the same lady if you told her that you haven't had a meal in two days, you got kicked out, you got kicked out of your apartment, 
or you know, or, or you're out of a job, she'd give you the coat off her back. Yet she doesn't think she's geared to raising children. She's going to have Anna plus four, five boys. And interesting, Sarah Delano Roosevelt. James Roosevelt later said that as we came along, and once we were old enough to understand, our grandmother would tell us, your mother might have bore you, but I'm really your mother. Imagine putting up with this for 10 years. 1905 going on to 1915, she almost had a nervous breakdown here, complaining to her husband. However interesting, 1915 is an important year because it's the year after the, what we call the First World War starts. And Franklin is beginning to make that run up into Democratic Party politics. And when we get into the war, uh, if you remember Woodrow Wilson got that declaration of war on April 6, 1917, he asked for it on April 2nd. It took Congress four days to deliberate this, four days. And we go to war. We join the Brits and the French and Japan against, against Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. Russia is now out of the war because Lenin took them out. Having said that, having said that, he is going to be under secretary of the Navy. Secretary of the Navy was Josephus Daniels. Franklin is the undersecretary. It means now he's going to be traveling a lot with these duties. And Eleanor, being the dutiful wife, always took care of the luggage and so on and so forth. But in 1918, she's unpacking his luggage and she finds some letters in one of his suitcases. Uh, there are love letters to a lady by the name of Lucy Mercer. That is her social secretary. Now, that's an issue. That's a problem. And now, now the cat's out of the bag. And interestingly enough, it's, you know, Franklin's been thinking of leaving her for a while. And Lewis Howe is his primary advisor. Keep in mind, folks, this is 1918. This is not 2024. It was different then. And he tells them, if you think you're going to go up through the ranks of the Democratic Party, you better rethink divorcing this lady. Sarah Delano Roosevelt. Interestingly enough, she says, you're the one that wanted to marry this lady. And if you divorce her, I'm going to disinherit you. You know, money has a tendency to change opinions. He won't divorce her, but the marriage is now changed and forever. They, they, they still have a regard for each other, but they can't fulfill each other in their marriage vows. They can't do that, not to this extent anymore. And when the war is over with, Franklin D. Roosevelt is still going to be rising into politics here for the Democratic Party. But Eleanor throws herself into politics. 1920, James Cox is running as the presidential candidate. Franklin is going to be vice president. He's running as vice president. They lose the election. They lose the election of 15 million votes to 9 million in 1920. And the Republicans are going to be in uh, for the entire decade of the 1920s. So he's going back to you know, being uh, you know, finance, bank, uh, banking, law, and so on and so forth. You know, the, the, the Roosevelt Empire here. Let's understand something, too. There are, the, there are the Hyde Park Roosevelts, and there's the Long Island Roosevelts, represented by Teddy Roosevelt. However, in 1921, at, Cam, at, Cam, at Capabello, uh, Fra Franklin D. Roosevelt is struck with polio. And here, Eleanor now begins to dominate, begins to dominate that, that busting heads with Sarah Delano Roosevelt. Sarah wants her son to retire and become a country gentleman. It's not like they can't afford that. Eleanor says, no. If he retires, it'll kill him. He's got to stay in the game which is exactly what he's going to do. She becomes a, a footman here for Al Smith, who's running for re-election 1924, governor of New York. 
She will throw herself into two campaigns in 1928, when Al Smith is the Democratic nominee for the presidency. At the same time, Franklin is, the, is, is, gonna, is running for the governorship of the state of New York. She throws herself in, in, into both of these campaigns. Franklin will win the governorship of New York. Al Smith is going to lose to Herbert Hoover. You know, interesting how some things never change here. You know, people, some things don't change here. Uh, during this campaign in 1928 for the presidency, some of the Hooverites were saying here, and some people are going to believe this stuff. It's interesting what people believe. Uh, you don't want to elect that Irish Catholic from New York. You don't want to elect him because if he becomes president, he's going to install the pope in the Oval Office. <laughs> and once he does, the Inquisition will replace the Constitution as the law of the land. And people believe this stuff. Maybe it worked out for the Democrats because what strikes here in 1929? The Depression. Now, Eleanor is, 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 Eleanor is interesting in the, in, the, in the Empire State. She goes north, south, east, west, villages, towns, cities, farms. What can we do for you? We're, we're, we're in the governor's mansion now. What can we help you with? This is what she's doing for her husband. So her husband still has polio here. And this is what she does. Another development happens here. 1920, 1930, some who are going to be really Democratic Party boosters here. Gerard Swope, who will later have influence here in, the Demo in, the, in Roosevelt's uh, presidency, comes up with a plan called the Swope Plan to get us out of the Depression. The Swope Plan is a plan by which major corporations and major financial institutions would run their industries. White collar workers will work so many hours a day. Blue collar workers will work, will work so many hours a day. Pay scales arranged. And guess what? A social safety net. How about that? Herbert Hoover says, no, nope, smells like warmed over fascism to me. And guess what's going to happen? He's going to be told, well, you ain't getting the money and for 1932. Guess who's going to get the money for president? Roosevelt. Of course, the Depression doesn't help Hoover. How do you think it's going to help a president who says, during my term, people gave up good jobs for better ones selling apples? <laughs> Roosevelt sweeps it in 1933. Eleanor here is going to turn this, being a first lady, into an office. You know, you know there, there's always the transition period between the previous administration to the next administration. And it's no different with the first ladies. She actually sits down and talks to Lou Henry Hoover, who was Mrs. Herbert Hoover, who at one point was an ardent suffragist. An ardent suffragist. And she tells Eleanor, being an ardent suffragist, however, once she became first lady, she fit right into that ambiance of being uh, a hostess, you know, planning the parties, not really having, not really making any real big decisions here. How do you think that went over with Eleanor? Not, not my watch. It's not happening here. And so she's going to change being a first lady. In fact, the first year in office, she's traveling all over the, all over the country giving speeches in 1933. She made $75,000. You know what she do with most of that money? Turns it over to charity. Now, let's understand something. It says in the United States Constitution, it's there, it's called the Emoluments Clause. Presidents are not supposed to make any money during the presidency in, in, uh, as, opposed, as opposed to what they're being paid for by, by the taxpayer. That's law. That's in the Constitution, that makes it law. Well, you know the situation going on now. What happened to the Constitution here? But she's not tied to this, but she does it anyway. And that's what I find interesting. She does it anyway. Most of that money went to charity, and she's getting a, sometimes $1,000 a lecture here in 1933. Now, let's understand what's happening in the world, though. Let's understand what's happening in the world. Because 1933 is arguably the worst year of the Depression. 
When Roosevelt took the oath of office, March 4, 1933, that's when they used to do it. They didn't do it in January, it was March 4. When he took the oath of office, 9,000 banks have closed. There's no social safety net. The unemployment rate is 25%. And 11 million savings accounts wiped out. Yeah, not a good time here. Yet, a month and a half before, actually the exact date is January 30, 1933, a man rose to become chancellor in Nazi Germany. His name is Adolf Hitler, and Germany has, a, uh, has an unemployment rate of one-third. Interesting where the world's going, huh? And on top of that, Joseph Stalin is in the middle of industrializing the Soviet Union. In fact, by 1941, the Soviet Union would be the world's second leading industrial power, and Soviet industrial, Soviet industrial might will be one of the biggest secrets for Allied victory in World War II. And that's not the last you're going to hear of this. So the world is interesting here when the Roosevelts get into the White House. Roosevelt's going to come up with, he's going to try to do anything he can to get us out of this depression including turning off the conservatives by using government power to get us out of the depression. Eleanor, interestingly enough, interesting some of the people she's meeting here. Amelia Earhart, she wanted Amelia to teach her how to fly. She actually flew with Amelia. Mm -hmm. There was a story that used to float Washington that, and Franklin D. Roosevelt liked her too. Uh, there was a story that used to float Washington that Amelia was a guest of the Roosevelts, and, and Eleanor and her got all gussied up and snuck out of the White House for a night on the town. <laughs> That's not happening anymore, is it? You know, the old good old days here. Interesting, too, Eleanor, what Hoover's last year, you had what you called uh, the, the bonus soldiers. World War I soldiers, these guys, some of these guys are, are, are really being hit hard by the Depression. And they were promised bonuses after the war. And they want them now. They don't want to wait. And the Hoover administration is not paying them. And they're going to get pushed out of Washington. They're living in tents, hovels, and so on and so forth. And guess who's going to push them out? General Douglas MacArthur. And guess who his adjutant is? Dwight Eisenhower. And some of these hovels are burned down, these guys pushed out. They come back the next year when Roosevelt's in the White House. And they want their bonuses. You know who goes to visit them? Oh, no. Yeah, she goes into the tents, the hovels. Uh, where are you from? How tough is it? Can we help you? So on and so forth. And you know what begins to be said here in these tents and hovels? Last year we were here, the president sent the army. This year we come, he sends his wife. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's also going to try something. Oh, and there's another man here. Uh, another man here. Uh, well, Lewis Howe is still still an advisor here for um, for uh, uh, President Roosevelt. But there's another man that, that that comes up here. Earl Miller. Earl Miller was a New York State policeman. Earl Miller was, was assigned by President Franklin D. Roosevelt to be her bodyguard when he was governor of the state of New York. She's 44 at the time, 1929, and Earl Miller is 32. He is a bodyguard, but he's her constant companion. Taught her how to ski, they go dancing, they go hiking. He's always with her. Of course, what happens here? The stories start? Yeah. Now, interesting, there are some people who say that she was that man she's gonna ha she has an affair with behind her husband's back, although he's still having an affair here with Lucy Mercer. I mean, uh, that, that's still going on. I mean, Margaret Rutherford, his private secretary, supposedly. You know, again, they can't fulfill their marriage vows, yet at the same time, they have their lives of their own, but politically, they support each other a lot although she will have some differences of opinion with her husband, and I'll get to that. I'll get to that. But Earl Miller, supposedly, they, they traded a number of letters here. And the question is, where'd those letters go? After she died, um, 
Supposedly the letters, there are several stories here. One, the letters were burned, so we'll never get them. The letters are locked up or hidden in some kind of way. Doris Goodwin Kearns, remember her, the historian? She wrote about the Roosevelts. She seems to think that maybe this has been overblown, but if, well, unless we get to see those letters, speculation is idle here. She's probably got the right approach here. She probably has the right approach. But she tries to do something here in 1934. And this thing was known as Arthur Dale. Lorena Hickok, uh, who will become part of the staff, was actually one of the, the leading woman reporter here coming out of the late 20s and the early 1930s. She worked, she worked for Associated Press. And she fell, Matt, Matt we'll call it infatuated with Eleanor. She was a lesbian. Well, you know what, the stories are going to start here. And she got fired by the Associated Press. They thought her reporting now was becoming biased. She's hired by Eleanor to be a booster for the New Deal. Part of this is she wants to put into the New Deal this thing known as Arthur Dale. This is almost like a socialist attempt to help the miners. The miners who wanted to unionize got fired and blacklisted in West Virginia. So she goes down there. She, to put this thing known as Arthur Dale into place is, is, is almost like what Robert Owen did here in the early 1920s in New Harmony, Indiana, where he tried to set up a socialist experiment here. He bought 30,000 acres of land in Indiana. The thing flopped. Socialism wasn't ready yet here. But here, interestingly enough, she wants to build a complex that will house the miners, uh, schools for the kids, teach these miners new forms of employment, maybe factory work, you know, uh, wh whatever else, uh, fixing cars, whatever the case may be. The white miners do not want to be in the same place with Jewish miners or black miners. So now she's got to overcome this. She also has to overcome something else. The Republicans don't like this at all. This smacks of socialism, communism. Many Democrats, you can't mix business with government. Can't do that. Yet some of them are going to support Roosevelt and his attempt to use government to get us out of the Depression. You got that going on. Interesting. Interesting. This thing will last until 1940 because with the rise of the war coming on, and it's only a matter of time before we get into the second chapter of the Great War, uh, that money can't be spent for Arthur Dale anymore. But a lot of the people who lived in this said it was a brilliant success. Yet the detractors say it was a flop. But she tried this. Another thing that she's going to do, She's going to be one of those instrumental, while she's a first lady, to move the black constituency from the Republicans to the Democrats. It's big in this. In fact, uh, the, the Castigan-Wagner bill is a case in point here. The Castigan-Wagner bill comes out in 1934. This was an attempt by Congress to make it a federal crime to lynch blacks. Remember, that's going on here. And she supports this bill. She supports this bill. And she's going to bring in the NAACP and other leading black leaders to lobby her husband in the Oval Office to get him to sign the bill. She's very committed to this. In the end, her husband will not sign the bill. He's, a, he's, he's, a, he's concerned that if he does, he will lose the Southern Democratic vote to be reelected for 36. He didn't sign it. Another thing, Marian Anderson, the great black singer, uh, she was supposed to sing in Washington, D.C. The DAR wouldn't do it. They wouldn't let her. Eleanor, uh, Eleanor throws herself into this. Uh, there's, there's two things she's going to do. She's a member of the, daughter of the Daughters of American Revolution, cancels her, cancels her uh, membership to this, and then gets, gets Marian Anderson to sing at the Lincoln Memorial. 
And after this, she will occasionally bring in Mar Marian Anderson to the White House to sing at state dinners. You know, when they have uh, foreign dignitaries here. In fact, I think they did that when the king and the queen showed up. Marian Anderson. Let's understand something about this, what this lady's doing. This lady, unlike any, any, like any, any first lady before her, she will conduct in 12 years, in 12 years as first lady, 348 press conferences. She's the first first lady to address a presidential convention. She did so in 1940. This is the first, she's, this is the first first lady who will publish over 60 major, major articles in, in over 60 American major magazines. This is a first lady who, if you, uh, some of you might remember this history, who came up with that column, My Day, in 1936. And she does this six days a week, all the way out to 1962. This is a mover and a shaker. But let's understand something here, too. Uh, we're getting close to the war. 1939, Hitler invades Poland. 1940, uh, he invades the West, Denmark, Norway, followed on May 10, 1940, by France and the Low Countries. Britain is the only one holding on. Roosevelt does not want to lose Britain, does not want to lose it at all. In fact, to add to this, remember uh, Joe Kennedy? I'm talking about the elder Joe Kennedy who was our ambassador to the United States, uh, to the Britain from the United States. He's telling, he's telling Washington there's a new reality on the, in Europe. It's called Nazi Germany. We ought to ditch the British. That's not what Franklin wants to hear. And he knows Joe Sr. wants to run for the presidency of the United States, and he'll get the Irish vote. You know what's found out about Joe? <laughs> His telegrapher is is funneling secret Roosevelt and Churchill cable. Well, we're not in the war yet to the Nazis. MI5 found this out, which is the Brit which is Master Intelligence 5, which is Military Intelligence 5, which is their version of the FBI. They turn this over to MI6, which is our version of now of the CIA, who in turn turned this over to Hoover. You know how J. Edgar Hoover loved the Kennedys. And he gave this to Franklin D. Roosevelt. He will bring Joe Kennedy home for consultations, and he's going to tell him, here it is. You want to run for the presidency? You go right ahead. But this is coming out. Joe went home. John J. Winnett will now be the ambassador of the United States for Britain. Interesting. Yes, you had a question. Uh, you were talking about. I was just listening to all the other, you forget about the question. So John, but he died, Joe Kennedy. Joe Kennedy's a father, and then, then the other is... The Joe Jr. was the one they were grooming, but he got killed during the war. Yeah. Mm -hmm. when Donnie got killed. Yeah. Then the next one in line will be John, who will be assassinated in 63. In fact, Why? last November was 60 years ago. Yeah. So, so it's interesting where the country itself is going. And then on December 7, 1941, oh, yeah. the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, and we are in the war, which was only going to happen anyway. We were going to get sucked into this anyway. Right. It's a global conflict. All right. You said in World War I, right. we were with the Japanese. That's right. Japan was an allied power. Yeah. And all of a sudden? No. That, no, there was, no, there was friction between the United States even before World War I. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're coming on here as great powers as the British and the French decline. That's a separate talk, and I do that talk. We were with the in World War I. Right, right. But things are going to change. Great powers are great powers. That's how they work. And so here, we are now allies with the British. In fact, that day at Pearl Harbor, John J. Winnett and Averill Harriman, remember him? Yes is having dinner that evening in London, or Checkers, just outside London, with Churchill. Keep in mind, if it's 10 minutes to 8 in the morning in Pearl Harbor when the attack is finishing up, it's going on 8 o'clock at night in Britain. And they get snippets that the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor. 
and Churchill orders a telephone, a radio, and some paper and pencil. And the telephone, he calls up Roosevelt. And he says, is it true, Mr. President? Franklin D. Roosevelt, very somber, says, yes, Mr. Prime Minister, it's true. And with small talk, they said they'll, they'll keep in touch, as, as they've been doing anyway. It doesn't make any difference. They've been doing this anyway. And Roosevelt says to him, we are now in the same boat. Well, what do you think Churchill did? He ordered a round of brandies here for him, Winnet, and Harriman. Because now he knew with America in the war and the Soviet Union, we're going to win. In fact, he wrote that night. That night I went to sleep, I slept the sleep of the saved. He will come to the United States as a guest of Franklin and Eleanor, the White House. He stays there for three weeks, gives one of the greatest, greatest addresses to a combined Congress. You can find it on YouTube. It lasts about 15 minutes and 30 seconds. It's a great speech. But he's staying at the, with the, at the White House. Now, Churchill liked to stay up late at night, smoke a cigar, drink a brandy, two, three, four, or five, and talk history, politics, current events. And Franklin is trying to stay up, and he's, he doesn't have the Constitution. And Eleanor is on a slow burn here. What's wrong with Winston? Doesn't he know that Franklin is not the healthiest man in America? Yet Franklin, where else are you going to get this history for nothing? Look at it from that perspective. Interesting what happens here, just before Churchill's ready to go back to England, he's taking a shower. And Franklin didn't know he was in the bathroom and walked him on. Here's Churchill, naked except for a towel, he's drying himself off, and Franklin is turning all shades of red. And he, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Prime Minister, I didn't mean it. You know what Churchill finally said? You know, Churchill takes, Churchill's a great comeback king. Churchill said, don't worry, Mr. President, Apparently, there's nothing that the Prime Minister of England can hide from the, from the, Prime Minister, uh, from the President of the United States. And he let it go with that. He let it go with that. But, for, uh, but Eleanor, by the way, volunteers to go work with the Red Cross. Franklin, you know, as, it may, as, as maybe a volunteer nurse, uh, the president's uh, advisors talk him out of it. You know, it's nice you want to do this, go overseas, but supposing you get captured by the Germans or the Italians and wind up in a prison camp. Doesn't look good. The first lady is in a German or Italian prison camp. But in, in 1942, she will go to England. You know, the United States Army Air Force is building up its bomber strength here. And she's touring the bases and talking to the British. She's a big hit here, a big hit. Yet, at the same time, she's supporting her, president, her, her husband politically, but she is against something here. This must have been interesting, the Sunday afternoon dinners over this one. Executive Order 9066, the roundup of Japanese Americans for the internment camps. 110 to 120,000 will be rounded up. Eleanor is against this. How can you round up Americans to do this? How can, you, how can you do this? That really doesn't happen too much with the Italians and Germans. But it did with the Japanese. And Roosevelt will follow through. And many Japanese have to sell their property, their cars, uh, and they're going to be put in these internment camps. Now, what's interesting here in 1943, 1944, their sons will be in the United States Army fighting the Germans in Italy in World War II. And ironic as it will be, the 442nd Regimental Combat Team of Japanese soldiers will be the most decorated, will be the most decorated unit in the United States Army. Interest and their and their parents are in these internment camps. What a country, huh? Yeah. The same thing is happening in the Soviet Union. Stalin will round up over a hundred thousand Crimean Tatars, put them on the boxcars, and send them east into your Irkutsk, while their sons are in the Red Army fighting the Nazis. Wow, a TV screenwriter can't make this up. 
1943, Eleanor is on the road again, only she's going into the Southwest Pacific. Places like Vela La Vela, Bougainville, Munda, these are not vacation places. They're hell holes where these Marines and GIs are. And she's in the jungles with these guys, in the holes. Where are you from, son? Well, how you doing? Anything, anything I can take back home for you? That, you know, this kind of thing. And, and the commander here is, is, is Admiral William Halsey. And he said, one of the most popular people to stop by and see the troops under my command was Eleanor. Interesting. But then there's the downside here because of this lady. Her, her earlier support of the black movement, the civil rights movement here, when there were riots in Detroit, 1943, Chicago, uh, you know, the, the, the opponents of, 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 of the advancement of the black, what do you think they're saying about Eleanor here? It's her fault. It's her fault. Uh, Tuesdays, Eleanor Tuesdays, where black, they said black men would, would assault or beat up white women on Tuesdays? Who believes this stuff? Yeah, Eleanor Club, I think they were called Eleanor Clubs, where domestics would walk out on their employers in these houses, you know, the, the rich, so on and so forth, or beat them up. Stories, stories here. Interesting, they're blaming her for this. Fascinating. Yet, when the war is over, or not, not quite over, when the war is winding down here in 1945, Franklin uh, will go to Yalta for the, la for, uh, for the last conference with him, him, and, him and Stalin. This is the last time, and he looks terrible. He's dying here anyway. And then on Valentine's Day, he meets with Abdul Aziz Ibn Saud of Saudi Arabia, makes the deal, U.S. military protection for the kingdom versus preferential access to Saudi crude, and every president, be he Democrat and Republican, has catered to that agenda ever since. Oil, that's what matters here. But he dies April 12, 1945. Only Lucy Mercer is down at the house in Georgia. She, Eleanor is not. And the advisors have to get her out of that house fast because when the president dies, where are the journalists going? And, what, and, what, and what's particularly irksome here, if you're Eleanor, Anna is the one who was setting up some of these liaisons with her father, for her father. What a family this is, huh? What a family this is. It's also in the will that Hyde Park is to be turned over to the nation as a presidential library. This is really the first of that, what presidents are gonna do. Also something else, uh, you know, when the president died, all those cables and letters that the first lady gets bombarded, like Jackie Kennedy later will be bombarded with all of this. Uh, people, you know, wishing goodwill and so on and so forth. Do you know she got one from Stalin? She got one from Stalin. Have an autopsy done. <laughs> Thinking that maybe Franklin was assassinated here. You know, Stalin doesn't trust any, he doesn't trust his own mother. His mother put him in a seminary when he was a teenager. He called her a bitch and didn't see her for 40 years. That's the kind of guy you're dealing with. But he knew what he had with Roosevelt. He doesn't know what he's going to get. And he's going to get Harry Truman, and that's not going to work too well. Have an autopsy done. And Eleanor is going to say, apparently Mr. Stalin doesn't understand we are not that way. As a dutiful wife, she's going to take care of trying to get, of trying to get everything sold, everything that needs to be moved out, moved out of Hyde Park so this transformation to turn this into a presidential library can move ahead. She's going to live in New York, but she's not out of politics. Harry Truman is going to name her as our representative to the UN. Not only that, she is going to be a co-author of the, of, the of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. She's the director of human rights here. But she's a co-author of this. And the membership has to accept this. All these nations have to vote to accept this. They all do, except for eight. The Soviet Union doesn't. 
uh, and the Stalin also said that the five nations in the war in the Eastern Europe that they had occupied, they don't want it either. <laughs> Two other nations won't. South Africa and Saudi Arabia. But it doesn't matter. It's overwhelming and it's accepted. And it's still in force today. It's still in force today. There are some Democrats who think that Eleanor maybe should run for a, repre House, a House of Representatives seat in Washington, D.C. for New York. There are some who even think that maybe, just maybe, she ought to run for a Senate seat. There are some who think, how about getting her to be a VP candidate on a ticket? Eleanor refuses all this. She says, I'm not a politician. Oh, that's a lot of bunk. Of course she's a politician. You don't have to be a, a, an office holder to be a politician. You don't have to be an office holder. She is a politician, and a darn good one. She stays in the game in New York. In New York, uh, she gets in a problem here with Cardinal Spellman, St. Patrick's Cathedral here. There is a bill in Congress to, give, to get government money to parochial schools. She's against that. She's labeled anti-Catholic. She bowls her way through it, and she, do, and she has a confrontation here, numerous confrontations, with um, Cardinal Spellman, who labels her anti-Catholic. She'll have none of this. Also, Tammany Hall in New York. How many here are from New York, if you remember Carmine DeSapio? Remember that guy? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And her son, I think it was Franklin Jr., is running for the attorney generalship of the state of New York. And Carmine DeSapio doesn't want him. And Eleanor will jump into this. Of course, DeSapio was a shadowy character anyway. And she's going to get together with some Democrats and eventually get him kicked out by 1960. However, interestingly enough, by 1959-1960, there's a, a young man running for the presidency of the United States, John Kennedy from Massachusetts. And leading Democrats want her blessing. She's still a big name here, and they want her to sign on. She won't. Leading Democrats, and she tells them no. You know who else went to talk her? Because he, he was a Democrat then. You know, you, know who, you know who went to talk her into supporting Kennedy? Frank Sinatra. She told him no. <laughs> Gore Vidal, the great playwright, novelist, who was related to the Kennedys, by the way. He, tried, he, he got to know her very well. And she told him no. Finally, she will turn around and support him because she didn't want Nixon. And they're asking, well, why, why didn't you? She said, you know why? Because he did next to nothing to stop Joe McCarthy. That's why she wouldn't support him in the beginning. But once she did, she warned John and Jackie, keep your kids away from the press. She said, fortunately for you, your children are very young. Mine were a little older. She said, keep them out of the limelight. Kennedy's going to turn around and hire her as his ambassador for women's issues. And that's a position she will hold when she dies in November 1962. She was 78 years old. Interestingly enough, it's, it's in 1999 when I think it was Life magazine, Look magazine, came out with their Top, top influential Americans of the 20th century. She finished ninth, 39 years at, 37 <clears throat> years after her death. Yeah, that's staying power. That is staying power. Interesting. Yet it's probably Harry Truman who probably has the last word. When after she died, and he knew her, he knew her pretty well. He said she was not just the first lady of the United States. She was the first lady of the world, is what she was. But again, she left a legacy for future first ladies to aspire to. She is the one that turned this into an office, being a first lady. 
instead of being a hostess or a dinner planner. She turned it into something more sophisticated. Well, the country's getting more sophisticated. You know, you're just going to have the first lady be a hostess. How about Jimmy Carter's wife? She was a confidant and an advisor. And Eleanor shares something else with two other first ladies. Being the tallest, she was five foot eleven. Yeah. The other two are Mrs. Trump and Mrs. Obama. We haven't had a six footer yet. We'll probably have a six foot woman president before we have a six foot first lady. But if anybody has any questions or observations or comments, yes, ma'am. I just wonder how did the both Rosedales make their money in the first place? What, 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 what they well, that goes back well into the 19th century. Uh, railroad, law, banking. Uh, they were one of those determining families on Wall Street. They were. And they had close association with companies like GE, uh, the Rockefellers. Um, in fact, but in fact, though, interesting since you asked that, uh, and I have 113 pages of this, the McCormick Dickstein Committee of 1933-34. That was, that was the first House of Un-American Activities Committee, not McCarthy. They were investigating in 1933-34, uh, influenced by communists, fascists, and now Nazi Germany to undermine and suborn the country because of the Depression. Come to find out, this, this, this uh, reporter, John Spivak, asked the, McCor the, the, the uh, McCormick Dickstein, John, John McCormick and Samuel Dickstein, who were the chairman of this coming out of Congress, they were the chairman of this, if, 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 they could, if he could write a story on it. They said, yeah, he found something else. The plot against Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1934 to unseat Roosevelt. And the Morgan's interests were involved in this. Spring, uh, Spring, uh, Remington Arms, uh, Guaranteed Bank and Trust, uh, yeah, and elements of the American Legion. That will spawn a, a book and later a movie. Maybe you saw the movie or read the book, Seven Days in May. Oh, yeah. And the man who's the hero here is Smedley Darlington Butler, who joined the Marine Corps as a private and came out of it as a major general and is one of 19 Americans to get the Medal of Honor twice. Wow. And he turned all the plotters into Congress, and that began the investigation. And it's, an inter it's interesting. Uh, but the, the, it, the plot won't come off because Roosevelt is one of those who wants to put an end to this. Let's stop all this. We got a nation to keep, the, to keep together here. We can't have a revolution here or a coup. Uh, it, that, so that was in the background. Um, but, but, some, but some of these high money people, yeah, uh, were supported Roosevelt or didn't. And Franklin is telling them, I need money if we're going to get out of this. And this is where you're going to get Social Security. Yeah. Interest, interesting with the, the mechanics, the pieces that are moving here. Uh, it's a very, very tenuous time here in the United States, as it was in the globe with the Depression. Yes? Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. I'd like to maybe go a little more detail on this. You said, was it Elmore? Elmore had reservations about intimacy with Franklin when they got married? Yeah, after, after she found out about him having these affairs. No, no, I'm talking about. Oh, you mean having sex itself? Yeah, they had six kids. It seemed like. Right. They, yeah. That doesn't seem to go together too well. It doesn't seem to go together, but it does here. She, she was not a big fan of sex, yet she'll have six kids. She was fertile. Yeah, six times. I guess so. <laughs> But at the same time, um, you know, she didn't think she was geared to motherhood. Uh, and Sarah Delano Roosevelt horning in here, you know, that's going to divorce her from her kids to a certain extent here. Well, could that have been, uh, ended up being the cause of the problems with Lucy Mercer? That Franklin wasn't quite happy with. Uh, right. He wasn't. 
Right. Well, yeah, he was thinking of leaving her at this time. And of course, Lewis Howe, his primary advisor, is going to tell him, you can if you want, but what do you think is going to happen to your aspirations of going up in the Democratic Party here? You know, it's, again, it's 1918, not 2024, where you can bed hop here. Yeah, yeah, well, we know some people have done that. And one other quick question. <laughs> How did Franklin feel about his wife as someone who either helped or hindered his career? They supported each other. So he was happy with her politically. Yeah, I mean, he was all for her doing that thing, Arthur Dale. Yeah. Try it. You know, he's looking for almost anything to get us out of this depression. And he wants to make sure he keeps the mask with him. That's what he's trying to do here, too. Which is why he'll vote against that wagner castigan bill, that bill that would have made it a federal crime to lynch blacks. He doesn't want to lose the Southern Democratic vote. He doesn't want to lose that. So if I have to toss the blacks over the side here, he was willing to do it. Those are decisions you sometimes make as a politician that are nasty decisions to make. But that's what he does. That's what he does. And he won't listen to, he'll listen to his advisors of not, that's another thing Eleanor got angry with, bringing in escaped Jewish people from the camps. And she wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. He was listening to his advisors. Well, the Nazis will slip in saboteurs and spies. Okay, then we can't let them in. Yes? How did the Republicans uh, react to her? Let's say the Democrats loved her, but were they as supportive of her and just appreciated what she did? Some did, some did not. There were people who really liked her. There were people who couldn't stand her. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover thought she, he hated her liberalism. He didn't want to see blacks get more rights. J. Edgar Hoover. Um, yet he was willing to make sure Joe McCarthy wasn't going to get the nomination either. And he knew how to play the game. He's not stupid. Of course, he's a, he's a, he's a if you want to use the term, a secret police chief. They're all, they're all cut out of that same cloth, you know, Heinrich Himmler. Uh, people like this, uh, they don't trust anybody. That's Hoover. That's Hoover. And you know how powerful he'll be. He'll serve eight, nine presidents? Who did that in J. Edgar J. Hoover. Yeah. 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 So, interesting the power he has as the FBI chief. Interesting. But, yeah, um, but there were many Republicans who didn't like her. Some will condone her. Uh, but a lot of them didn't like her so-called liberalism back then. But the country's changing. It has to change. You can't keep going on with the 19th century. It's not going to work. Yes, ma'am. And what about the, um, you spoke of the two branches of the family, the Long Island side. Oh, yeah. Was, what was their opinion? Yeah, and in fact, in, in the early 1920s, was it 1924, I think it was? when um, Theodore Roosevelt's son was running for the go governorship of the state of New York, and she supported Al Smith to be reelected and didn't support her cousin. Whoa. Imagine going to that family picnic. Uh, she wouldn't support him. She supported Al Smith. Um, so you had that somewhat of that split between the, the, Republic, the Republican Roosevelt's versus the Democratic Roosevelt's here. Um, their family, but, but. So it's interesting, and yet it's Theodore who gives her away at her wedding. That he did, that he did. But uh, you know, my, my inkling here is she didn't quite get along with his son mm -hmm. and would rather have Al Smith be the governor of the state of New York. Of course, that's democratic politics. She's getting more involved in politics. And so she's learning to play the game here. And you do learn to play the game. And if that ticks off some members of your family, oh well. <laughs> oh well. Yes, it is interesting. Yes, ma'am. Well, most of her five children, I think they have five that survived, but they mostly all dysfunctional. From what I've read, it sounded like most of them all had big problems. Yeah, uh, James is the one, you've seen this in newsreel footages. Uh, of course, the country's different here. 
It's not like it is now. You don't. You think a man with man or woman with polio would get elected to the White House today? They seemed like they were focused on what was important from the waist up instead of the waist down then. Franklin was not a stupid man. He was a very intelligent individual. Does that matter having somebody like that in the White House? I would think so, instead of having some Timmy in there. But having said that, having said that, James, you could see this, James would assist his father to a podium so his father could make a talk, give a talk. And his, so his father could stand, not sit in a wheelchair, but stand. And it seemed that a lot of these journalists then really didn't focus that much on that. They focused on what maybe Roosevelt was saying. Today, I'm not so sure that would, that would work today. Today. Interesting. Interesting. Yes? But Roosevelt got us through the Depression and World War II. Didn't he get some grudging respect for that? Concerning he's in a wheelchair? Let's understand something. Franklin, Franklin was a schemer too. And he knew that we needed to support the British. One of the reasons is the British, the, England is an unsinkable aircraft carrier. We can't lose that. And he will support the British as, for, and, and something else George Marshall, who was the chief of staff, impressed upon Franklin D. Roosevelt. Again, geography. You know that thing Americans don't seem to do too well with anymore? Mm -hmm. He pointed to Iceland and Greenland, and he said, those two possessions, if the Germans get them, those are two pistols pointed at Canada and the United States. Mm -hmm. So we can't let the British fall. Well, what I'm asking is, what did it, Roosevelt's critics think, considering he got country through the Depression and uh, World War II? Well, it's really the war that gets us out of the Depression. Because it's really the war that gets us out of the Depression. What you're seeing develop here in the 1930s is American isolationism. You know, well, we got into that war in 1917, and look what good it did us. They're, at, they're, going to, they're, they're leading up to a war again. We don't want to get involved. That's their problem. Yet Franklin knew we we're going to get sucked into this. And it's not an accident that the first B-17 flies in 1935. It's not an accident that the first of America's new fast battleships are going to be laid down in American shipping yards in 1937. It's not, a, it's not an accident that the first B-24 Liberator, another heavy bomber like a B-17 flies, and that Congress is going to earmark over $30 million to, re, to build up the Navy in 1940. Now, what's happening here? Between 1939 and 1941, 8 to 10 million Americans go back to work. They could, his critics couldn't criticize his uh, leadership during the war, could they? Not really. He was almost, if you want to use the term, the perfect war leader. From the perspective, from the perspective, you know, if, if you're Roosevelt and take a look at the commanders you have, you're going to sleep nights. You're going to sleep nights. Eisenhower, MacArthur, uh, Bradley. Uh, Nimitz, Spruance, people like this, uh, Archie Vandegrift, Marine Corps, you're going to sleep nights. You know, Franklin was the type, you know, okay, I want to go here, but you handle it. And then it's hands off. That's how he was. You didn't have him breathing down your neck. Interesting. You might have MacArthur breathing down your neck. You might have Eisenhower breathing down your neck, but not Roosevelt. But as long as he knew they were doing, and they were, they were doing the job. Hands off. And very, it wasn't, it wasn't, in fact, he did, he did broker the dispute between Chester Nimitz and, 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 George, and, uh, and General MacArthur. You know, MacArthur made that promise. Remember that? I'm, I'll, I'll ret I shall return to the Philippines. Nimitz and the Navy wanted to bypass the Philippines, get on to Formosa, or what you call today, Taiwan, and then jump on to the, Japanese, the Chinese mainland. And MacArthur said, no, 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 no. He, 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 he was able to get his way. And we went to the Philippines. But then Nimitz got his way by invading Iwo Jima and Okinawa. So 
uh, Roosevelt was able to do both, <laughs> and broker both. But, you know, I think he saw in MacArthur, too. MacArthur had an ego twice the size of this, of, of this property. Good general, but boy, he had an ego and a half, like Patton did. So, but he was a good war leader. Almost, I won't say perfect, but if he's going to get perfect, it doesn't get any more perfect than this, because you, that's your job. That's why we sent you to West Point, Annapolis. You handle it, and then it's hands off. Interesting. But does he get credit for this? Yeah, I th yeah, he does. Unlike the Johnson administration of Vietnam, who were the, the ordering where companies are going to be moved, a captain does that, not the president. So you, you didn't get that in World War II. So, interesting. The country's different. It's tra it changed. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, fascinating. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I, and maybe this was said in the beginning, but I didn't catch where you um, give other talks or where one can find you to hear other talks that you give. Yeah, I have a website, and my calendar of events is there. Okay. In fact, I have, a, I have a business card. I can give you one if you want one. Um, I do World War One, World War Two. I do American history. Um, I also do a change of pace here. I also do a lot of current events because right now, if you're not, if you're, <laughs> I'm sure you, you know, Middle East is a, you know, one of the one of the top, as is Ukraine. Uh, so I give talks on. I work in Army Aviation Magazine. I do historical research there. Okay. Could you say your website? It's right on. Yeah, it's Mark. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's on the. Thank you. So yeah, I do. I do, and I and it, and sometimes if I go to places a lot. And I do a lot of history, current events, and politics. I break it up by giving talks like on Jackie Gleason. <laughs> Jackie brings a lot to the table, including a lot of whiskey and cigarettes. Uh, I've given talks on Bogart, Betty Davis. Yeah, that's my favorite. Uh, the Marx Brothers, I've done them. They're fun to do. That's insanity, the Marx Brothers. Uh, but it kind of lightens up the load a little bit here, and then I go back to doing the history and so on. So, in fact, I just gave a talk on Joan Crawford the other night. Joan Crawford. And her and Betty Davis supposedly had this friction going, and yet when you listen to them, oh, she's such a great actress. You know, in public, and then supposedly when they did whatever happened to Baby Jane, remember that one when 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 Joan Crawford was killed at the end, and Betty Davis is dragging the body off the off camera. Supposedly, according to the the crew, Betty uh, Joan Crawford put lead weights in her clothes so Betty Davis had a problem getting the body off. God Almighty. <laughs> but they're fun to do, though. They really are. In fact, uh, I got to do third Friday. I have to do Clark Gable. So, uh, Clark Gable should be really good. I'm doing Clark Gable up the line. So I'm doing that. And what did he say at the end of that movie? Frankly, my dear, I don't yep. give a damn. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're interesting to do, uh, but it breaks up the. So where do you do that? Any place that wants me to. We're going to hopefully bring Mark back uh, to be a regular here. So Jackie Gleason. Gleason is fun. And we can do a fun one. And the last person on the honeymoon side. Joyce Randall. Yeah. It was a true one. It was hidden. Jackie, um, Jackie didn't have a, t a, a, a good beginning here. Um, he was poor, and when his mother died in 1935, his girlfriend's father was going to take him in. So it's the Depression. And Jackie's 19, he's got 36 cents in his pocket, and he politely turned that down, and he says, nope, I'm going to go into Manhattan and try to make it. So he crosses the Brooklyn Bridge in 1935 with 36 cents in his pocket, and 22 years later, CBS is paying him 14 million. Uh, who's it? Jackie, Jackie Gleason. Gleason. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Uh, that's the best 36 cent investment <laughs> I've ever heard of. Yeah, he, he brings a lot to the table. Of course, he drank more whiskey and bourbon than there was water in Long Island Sound. <laughs> and he used to smoke five or six packs of cigarettes a day. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So he's an interesting guy, Gleason. Funnier than all heck. He really was. And he was a brilliant, a brilliant entertainer. Forget just comic. Brilliant entertainer. He really was. Good actor. Interesting. Thank you for coming. You're welcome. Thank you for coming. Have yourselves a wonderful afternoon.